Professor Rodham Narasimha requires no introduction to the Institute community. He is a renowned aerospace scientist and fluid dynamicist. He, he, he obtained his PhD degree at the Caltech. He was associated with the aerospace department initially and founded the Center for Atmospheric Sciences and also headed the National Aerospace Labs. He is the ISRO Distinguished Professor at IASC and JNCASR, a member of the Space Commission and also co-chairs the Joint Steering Committee and the Joint Scientific Working Group for the Indo-French Atmospheric Research Satellite Megatropics. He is a Fellow of the Royal Society. In India, his distinctions include the Bhatnagar Prize and Padma Bhushan, among many others. He is the author of more than 200 research publications and 15 books. Currently, he is at the Engineering Mechanics Unit of the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, JNCSR, India. Welcome, sir. In a peculiar way, uh, it's not an accident that uh, there is no Indian university today who, which can claim that this debate among different disciplines, among different views, takes place uh, in a scholarly atmosphere, the way that these debates took place in our own country, in our own civilization, centuries ago. Uh, it's, uh, it's, from one point of view, a tragedy <clears throat> that the modern Western university, the modern Western liberal university, so-called, is, is often closer in spirit mm. to our classical universities, like Nalanda and Takshashila, than the Indian universities of today. A place like Nalanda could harbor a mathematician like Aryabhatta, but also a variety of Buddhist scholars, and a variety of people in, uh, with, with other views, in grammar, in art, in uh, science, in mathematics, in philosophy. We now have very few places in India where you can actually have that kind of encounter. So I hope that what this book will do and incidentally, I recommend that all of you should read this book and um, debate it within yourselves and uh, with your friends uh, about the description that's given there of Vendic civilization, the Vendic worldview. Well, there are, many, there are many interesting chapters here and many points that have been made. I also like very much the one that discusses order and chaos. Now, a famous French poet said that India has chosen disorder. <laughs> now, now that, that's actually a very interesting statement to make. I, I think he's, uh, he's not quite right, but, but it's a very interesting statement to make. <clears throat> uh, disorder and chaos in India is something which all of us constantly comment about. <clears throat> But to think of the idea that you deliberately choose disorder, which is what Paul Valdry was talking about, uh, is an interesting proposition. There's some truth in it. I remember that uh, there was a well-known Russian scientist who came to spend a summer here uh, with me at the Institute of Science. Uh, that was 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, he came one day, although we had agreed that he would come, he turned up one day without telling me that he was coming on that day. So I asked him why. I said, I didn't know that you were coming, but it's wonderful. <laughs> Come on in. And he said, well, you see, it took me several years to get the permission to leave. And as soon as I got the piece of paper, I left before they would uh, prohibit me from going, he said. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> his, favorite <clears throat> his favorite pastime was to stand in front of the bazaar in Malaysia, you know, where you sell vegetables and flowers and so on. And I've seen him several times stand there on the sidewalk with an absolutely, um, what do you call it? <laughs> with, with, with an absolutely wonderful smile on his face, just looking at everything that was going on. So once I caught him in the bazaar and said, what are you doing here? He said, oh, I'm just watching it, he said. And I said, well, what, what do you find so interesting in watching it? You know, this chaos is so pleasant, he said. <laughs> when I see all these people arguing about prices, <laughs> so many different colors, so many different kinds of people here, so many different dresses, and the argument going on. But you see, the argument is pleasant, and they're all having fun. See, in my country, I can't do that, he said. Well, so there is that point. But actually, I think what uh, 
Indic civilization has, has uh, tried to do is to make a balance between order and chaos. And there are many examples of this. One that I think is uh, <clears throat> uh, most commonly accessible is our classical music. Now, our classical music from one point of view <clears throat> uh, has to be performed, has to be sung <clears throat> within fairly strict rules. However, those rules allow for a lot of improvisation. A piece of uh, classical Western music, you know, everything is laid down. Now, in India, even though you are singing, singing a Kriti of Tyagaraja, so the Kriti is all written, the Raga is determined, all of us, all of us who go to listen to that concert, always want to find out what this musician, this singer, is going to make different in what we have heard from before. So it encourages diversity, <clears throat> but it encourages diversity within a fairly strict set of rules. And in fact, it seems to me that uh, Indian art has, uh, has achieved a certain balance between uh, freedom and rules. Another example is uh, grammar. See, if you look at Panini's grammar, at first, I mean, this is the impression I had myself before I started looking into it. At first, the impression you have when you listen to what people say about it is how it's made Sanskrit into a set of very rigid rules. Well, the rules are strict, that is true. And it's remarkable that there was somebody who could put in the grammar of Sanskrit into 3,987 rules or some such thing. It's a large number, but it's not, not uh, it is a finite number. But if you read Panini, he makes it very clear, or Patanjali, they make it very clear. This is the Sanskrit as spoken in this part of India. And they say it varies from one part to another. <clears throat> not only that, in that region, it's not the Sanskrit spoken by everybody. It is the Sanskrit spoken by what it calls sisters. Well, who are sisters? It defines sisters. It says sisters are those who are educated, but not grammarians, you see. This is not, this is not the Sanskrit of the grammarians. This is the Sanskrit that the sisters speak. They're educated, but they're not grammarians. They are not affluent. If you go to their house, they don't have more than one pot of grain. So he defines a certain group of people, and he says, this is the language they speak. And it was an extraordinary scientific effort, because unlike the impression that people have that these rules were prescriptive, they were not. They were descriptive. The question that they were answering was, how is it that these people who do not know grammar always speak correct Sanskrit? So he wanted to infer the rules that were behind the speech that they were making. Once again, you can see how diversity and uh, how diversity was recognized, but always these rules were kept in mind as well. Well, I want to congratulate uh, Rajiv for uh, the splendid effort that he has put in uh, to make such a, uh, an account of the Indic worldview accessible to readers of today, written in today's language, and I think that I hope that. Uh, many young people here will actually get to read it. Well, I think that uh, this book, um, because it, it, it describes these positions so clearly, so lucidly, should help Indians to look at their worldview with what I would call critical confidence. Uh, very often, Indians have been, certainly in the older generations, and certainly in my generation when I was young, and I hope that the new young generation is very different from us, certainly look at these issues with confidence and squarely in the eye. At the same time, that confidence <coughs> must also go with uh, the ability to be critical. What we really need is uh, the ability to look at ourselves with the critical confidence, with the critical confidence of an insider who is part of it, who respects it, who knows what great achievements have been, have come out of that civilization. But in keeping 
with the same respect for other views that this book talks about, always willing to listen to other people who had a different view. Now the knowledge of the past is from one point of view essential for that confidence. But in the end, you must understand that it is not decisive. Something more is needed. And what that's needed, apart from this uh, critical self-confidence that I mentioned, and incidentally, that critical self-confidence is necessary because we must also have confidence in our ability to correct ourselves. And this, once again, has been very characteristic of Indic civilization. That is why, right from the Vedas, we've always been told, you have all heard that famous uh, Rig Vedic verse, where it says, let thoughts come from everywhere. Gandhi said, I want my windows open so that breezes blow here from everywhere. I don't want to be blown off my feet. That uh, ability to that self-correction is actually what will enhance our confidence. But in the final analysis, uh, that confidence will only come from achievement. And I think that is what uh, the new generation must really Indic uh, civilization spread across Asia and other parts of the world in a very peculiar and interesting way, very different, once again, it's a part of being different from the way that other civilizations have done. It was most of all very soft. Buddhism, for example, spread across Asia. And uh, one of the things, very interesting things I found was about the history of Southeast Asia. Uh, the history of Southeast Asia has been written by several French scholars. And one point they made struck me. Till about the 5th century AD, Southeast Asia was basically dominated by Chinese civilization. But after about that time, slowly, as Indians from the East Coast, from Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Orissa, and so on, Kalinga, <coughs> started going towards Southeast Asia. They slowly displaced Chinese culture and became the dominant influence. And they tried to find out how this happened because there was no military invasion. No Indian king went with his troops to Southeast Asia. What actually happened was that uh, these Indians went there, settled down, and in fact the fact that they had no military political link with the mainland was what actually made them so accepted. To the, to the people of Southeast Asia. Every Chinese person who was there owed his allegiance to the emperor. The Indians who were there did not owe their, owe their allegiance to an emperor in India, but they owe, owed their allegiance to a certain set of Indian ideas, this being different, this tolerance and this respect for other views. And so they say how this actually won them over. And of course, the versions that they made of our epics of the Ramayana, for example. In fact, this is from Southeast Asia, isn't it? This image. Yes, yes. <laughs> See, this image is from Southeast Asia. And yeah, you go there, you listen to the Ramayanas in uh, Bali, for example. It is different from what you've heard in India. But that is, in fact, the strength of the Indian approach uh, in civilization. Well, I could go on like that. But really, what I want to say is that uh, Rajiv must be congratulated for putting this, this exposition of the Indic worldview before a contemporary modern audience. I hope all of you will read it and begin to see why this worldview has been different and in what respects. And talk about it, debate it. And I think that. Uh, that will be a great thing to happen because uh, we have for a long time <clears throat> been unable to do it. I think partly because of our educational system, partly because of our recent historical experience in the last few centuries. And I think this is something which is now high time that we overcome. And Rajiv Malhotra has made a great contribution to making that change in our country and in our worldview. And in your view, so thank you very much, Rajiv. I hope thank you very much. The book certainly seems to have got the fancy of Professor Rodan. Coming.
it's a quite an in-depth uh, critique of the book thank you